Good morning. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. We're taking a look at the scripture readings for the coming Sunday. And this particular Sunday ahead of us, November 1st, will be observed as All Saints Day because that actually is November 1st. This is a, uh, a day the church uses to recognize and commemorate those who have fallen asleep in Jesus or as is the case with two people, Enoch and Elijah, taken away by the Lord alive. So, you know, we, we commemorate them, but they never died. All the other saints we commemorate have fallen asleep in Jesus, as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15. And so as we uh, look at the readings, we are going to be talking a little bit about the practice of the early Christian church in connection with uh, martyrs. Um, as, as we use the word martyr, today it means someone who dies rather than deny their faith in, in uh, God, Jesus Christ. The word itself, Greek word martyr, means witness. And the early Christian church identified these individuals as giving witness to Jesus Christ by dying rather than denying him. Rather than doing something convenient, uh, physically beneficial for them, personally helpful, however you want to say that, they would allow themselves to be thrown out of their job, chased out of town, put to death. And so the early Christian church identified the process of someone dying as a condition of acknowledging Jesus Christ publicly, dying a good death. And the, uh, the term then that was used for one who was leaving this world to go to be with God was also the word translation, which is a Latin word. It, it really means to be moved from one to another. The German word for translation is Ebersetzen, which means to translate both words, Eber, over, trans, another place, lay, set, to translate means to take from one place to another, from one language to another. So when you translate from this world to eternal presence of God, dying, falling asleep in Jesus, the early Christian church would identify that as Christians we look at the world differently than those who are not Christians. You're familiar with the hymn, I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. Okay. And what we are looking forward to is Christ coming at the end of the age, raising our bodies and joining the Lord in heaven. But what scripture tells us very clearly is that it's appointed unto us once to die, after this comes judgment, and that when a person who is a believer in Jesus dies, the body returns to the soil from which it came. God made Adam, literally, out of dirt. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living one. A person who was alive. Nefesh is the Hebrew word used there. But basically, um, ever walked into a store and uh, they have clothing display? And you walk by and, and you, you know there's a, a mannequin, we call it, over in the corner. But if they dress them up just right and put them in exactly the right position, you may actually do a double take and think it's a person at first. Okay. Well, think about... Adam, formed by God out of the dirt, lying there on the ground, if you will, out of the dirt he was formed, looking completely lifelike, but with no life in him. And then God breathed into him the breath of life, gave him a spirit, if you will. So when it says the, the, the body returns to the dirt or the soil from which it came, and the spirit returns to God who gave it, that's a reference back to creation. So the early Christian church would identify one who had died 
rather than deny Jesus as a witness to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and God. And so this was the word martyr. And over the centuries, the word martyr has now come to mean one who dies for the faith. Or we sometimes use the slang way of saying, well, don't be a martyr, which means, okay, I'll suffer. You have that, I'll do without. You no, know, well, don't be a martyr. You ever heard anybody say that? Yeah, okay. That's not what the word means. <laughs> but it's the way we've used it. It's what it's come to mean, one who suffers rather than deny. So if you deny yourself something rather than having it so that someone else can have it, but you make a big deal about the fact that you denied it, you're not being a very good witness, are you? Or as Jesus put it, Sermon on the Mount, we'll get to the... Uh, Gospel reading, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you give a gift, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. In other words, you give to God out of thanksgiving. You don't worry about how it's going to look to other people. So your, your giving of a gift, thanksgiving, returning to God, what he's already given to you, in your alms, in your generosity, he says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Which sounds a little weird when you hear it the first time. But, you know, most of us in this room are right-handed. Some of you may be left-handed. Do we have any sinister person among us? Or are you dexterous? The Latin word dexter, right, sinister, left. So if a person is ambidextrous, they have two right hands. No, they don't. They only have one. <laughs> See, we say things and not know what we're saying. The left hand was then considered a hand used for deceit or evil. Ehud, one of the judges, take a look at it. God raised him up to rescue the people and, uh, of Israel, and he was left-handed. So when he went to visit the, the ruler of the foreign country oppressing God's people, he had his left hand and stabbed him, which is really the origin of the concept of something being sinister when it's done with the left hand. Okay, so we look at, at these words, and we say we're going to let our right hand know what our left hand is doing. We're not going to be a martyr. When we look at the word martyr, then it's a witness. But the early Christian church would take those who had died for the faith, martyred, if you will, and most often, if they could, they would bury that person close to the place where they died. Now, sometimes people were killed in the arenas, and so they could obviously not bury them there. It was also a not uncommon practice for a person to be tied into a, a gunny sack with a, a chicken and a wild cat or other type of animal and thrown into the river because those animals would struggle to get out of the, the, the sack in which they were drowning and they would rip apart the person in the bag with them who was also dying by drowning. This was the Roman method of killing people. Well, if, you know, if a Christian was thrown in the river, you can't bury him in the river. Okay. So they would take this person's body and they would bury it and then they would build an altar of thanksgiving to God and have a church on the location of the person's death or burial site. So many ancient Christian churches, Alexandria in Egypt, for instance, at one time, had the bones of St. Mark, the apostle, evangelist rather, in the church in Alexandria, Egypt. At some point in time, the folks from Venice in Italy went and stole the bones from St. Mark's burial site in Alexandria, Egypt, and moved them to St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. But see, the idea of the bones being where the person died to say, here's where they were translated. Here's where they left this world 
to be with the Father after they died. And so the early Christian church would commemorate the death of a person as the day of their translation. And so a saint's day, St. Andrew is on November 30th. You know, this month of November, we have St. Andrew's Day, which is actually an advent. So it's the first Christian observance of the church year is November 30th, St. Andrew's Day. Well, that would have been the, the day on which the early Christian church identified St. Andrew dying. Not his birthday, his, his translation day. So the saints' days were always commemorating someone leaving this world and its suffering and pain and sorrow and sin and problems behind. Okay, so we're going to observe All Saints Day. Remember I mentioned some Christians were thrown in the river, others were killed in the arenas, um, some were crucified, others killed in ways that their bodies were burned and destroyed completely. And so there was nothing to bury and no place to bury them. So the response of the Christian community was to establish a day on which all the saints who died are commemorated. And that's the first day in November. So we'll observe All Saints Day this coming Sunday. Okay? Now, keep in mind what I just told you about the burial practice of the early Christian church as we look at Revelation chapter 7. We encounter here the, the first scene of, of the end of the age. Uh, Jesus, the Christ, is opening the seven seals here in Genesis, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 7. We have Jesus um, present in the throne room, if you will, of heaven. And so we'll start at, at uh, chapter 7, and uh, I'll just read the first couple of verses from chapter 7. They're not on our printout, but... After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And then we're told the... The number is 144,000 sealed, and that number is symbolic, okay? It's the full number of 12 times 12, which is 144, times 10 times 10 times 10, thousand, so you have 144,000. So the number is a symbolic number of the completeness of all God's people brought into God's eternal home, okay? So don't ever let anybody fool you into thinking these numbers have to do with the actual population of heaven. It's symbolic, all right? And after we're told about this tribe, uh, 12 tribes being identified, and Ephraim and Manasseh, by the way, um, are normally listed, but in this case, the one missing is Levi, I'm sorry, Levi is present, but what's missing here is the process of numbering the tribes. And if you go through there, the tribe of Dan is out. Joseph replaces Dan. Because the tribe of Dan is noted for constantly rejecting worship of the true God. And they're the northernmost tribe of the 12 tribes in their geography. But the reality is they moved from where God tell, told them to go and, and settled a different spot. And so they're left out in this, geneal this listing of the 12 tribes. Okay. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And what's happened is this is between the sixth and the seventh seal. 
Again, the seven is the number of God finishing his work. So this seventh seal is about to be opened, but we won't get to that yet. And they were crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The Lamb, clothed in white robes, uh, the, the Lamb dressed as one who has been slain, is part of the vision he sees. And now the Lamb is sitting on the throne, and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living ones. Um, my personal preference is not to use the, the word creatures there. The Greek word is, is a, a participle, zoane, and it means living beings, but it just says living. It doesn't say they were created. And I intentionally avoid using the word creatures here. Living ones, living beings, but the word creature is, is not in the Greek word. Now, you think about zoology as the study of living animals. You have them in a zoo. And so some people might say, okay, so that means it's a living creature. That's an, that's an extension of the word zoo, zoane, to live. I prefer the word living beings or living ones. And partly that's because we're told that these living beings look like a man, an ox, an eagle, and a lion, which are representatives of the four Gospels. And the Gospel is not created, but it is living and active. So. I sometimes just try to avoid certain words that may communicate things that are not quite there. Okay. And they fell on their faces before the throne. Who fell? All the angels and the elders and the four living ones and the crowd and the great multitude. And they all fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, and now uh, interestingly enough, this is a, uh, a Hebrew prayer form. The revelation John has received includes the Hebrew prayer word Amen. We've carried that over from Greek into Latin into English, Amen. It's a Hebrew verb. It basically means uh, the job is done, things are, things are as good as guaranteed, um, you can count on it, you translate that several different ways, okay? But it's, uh, it's the, the words that were used when Jesus would take an oath and say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly. What he actually said was, Amen, Amen. Okay? So this word is, is not the end of a prayer, per se, although we frequently end prayers with it. It is a statement of belief that God is going to do what he has promised. All right? So God is going to do what he has promised. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. God is going to do as he promised. So if you want to get a better sense of what, what the word amen or amen does as beginning and end of this hymn of praise, okay, the chant or the words expressed, it's an expression of faith. faith pardon me. Then one of the elders, there were 24 elders, 12 for the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 for the 12 apostles of Jesus, the 24 elders around the throne. Okay? Or to put that another way, all of the founding members of the people of God, Old Covenant and New Covenant. So it's the whole people of God represented not just in the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, excluding the tribe of Dan, which, as I explained, gets kicked out liturgically, if you will, and the 12 apostles, 24 elders, okay? And one of the elders, we don't know which one, addressed John in his vision, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know... 
And John himself obviously didn't. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And there are those who will attempt to describe the great tribulation as a special period in history. Um, toward the end of the age. But that's not an accurate representation of, of what's going on here in the vision. The great tribulation would be those who wash their robes white in the blood of the Lamb are believers in God's promise in Jesus Christ, or the Messiah, before they knew his name was Yeshua. So these will come out of the great tribulation would include the prophets killed in the Old Testament, the people of Israel who had believed in the promise of God's anointed one coming, David's heir, and were killed by the Assyrians or the Babylonians. They came out of the great tribulation of this world and its suffering because of sin. Now the great tribulation is certainly a multiplying of sin's effect on the world, and you and I encounter that every day we walk on this earth. And if I can be very blunt, the claim of evolution is that by selection of certain characteristics, improvement is being produced in the changes going on in the world around us. Which means pretty soon people are never going to need glasses or hearing aids because evolution will give us the population that's improved and no longer has these problems. I know some people who are in their 90s and don't need glasses to read. Not very many, but I know some. And I know some people who are in their 90s and can hear perfectly well. Not very many, but some. Here's the question. If we're getting better and, and evolution is true, then why are more of us needing glasses and hearing aids? Why haven't we solved this problem? What's wrong with our evolutionary process? Why aren't we getting better? Maybe the answer is evolutionary process isn't real. <laughs> And we're actually all getting worse because it's compiling years and years and generations of sin in the world, making things worse. Which is consistent with scripture, by the way. Just making things worse. These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Which is, of course, a, a symbolic statement for you and me being cleansed from sin and guilt in Jesus Christ. Let me ask this another way. If you're wearing a white robe, washed in the blood of the Lamb, are you counted guilty? No, because you're wearing the white robe. It's white in the blood of the Lamb, which is going to be a trick question in the sermon. So hang in there. <laughs> I'll get to it in the sermon. <laughs> All right. Therefore, because they have come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, therefore, on account of that, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They've had a complete change. They've gone from tribulation, suffering, sorrow, difficulty, to the presence of God, and they will be in his temple day and night. And the one sitting on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Now, this reminds me of the book of Jeremiah, where the people are claiming that Jeremiah is lying about the destruction of Jerusalem, partly because they say God's temple is in Jerusalem, therefore God will never allow the city to be conquered by an enemy, and be destroyed because God's temple is there, and so God would not allow the temple to be desecrated. That was the argument being made in Jeremiah's time, to which Jeremiah replied, of course, don't trust in the building, trust in the living God. The vision Jesus gives to John includes the real residence of God. The true temple, if you will. The one not made with hands. That Jesus talked about. And Jesus is explaining to John through the words of the elders that these people are now in God's presence. 
and they will be with him day and night. Now what's interesting is, this vision then is showing us things that occur before the end of the, the age, because they're in the presence of God now, but others are not there yet. Revelation concludes with the heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of the sky, if you will, down to the new created place. Because the old is gone and the new has come. And in that new created place, there is no more night. And they don't need any artificial light caused by a burning star because the light of the world, the Lamb, is its light. Okay. But here there's still day and night. So as you, as you run through the vision, you have to recognize that certain things that exist right now won't be the same once Jesus comes at the end of the age. But these folks are in his presence before the end of the age. They will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Wait a minute. Can a lamb be a shepherd? Yes. Okay. <laughs> when he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Absolutely. And, and as fascinating as this is, keep in mind that what God says about you and me through the psalmists and other places where Isaiah tells the, the account of the man who built a vineyard and the, the Ezekiel's warning about the false shepherds of Israel, you know, the, the, the constant concern that the leaders aren't caring for the people properly. And what, is the, what are we reading the Psalms? And we uh, even chant it in one of our liturgical portions. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Well, Jesus is the word who became flesh. He is the one who took on human nature and became one of us, and therefore he is qualified to be a lamb. Because we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand, Jesus took on human nature and became a lamb. It's consistent when you do the whole biblical line of God is the caretaker of his flock. Okay? And at the same time, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so now what we're told is the... And by the way, this, this lamb is, looks like a lamb who has been slain. Sacrificed. And yet he's alive. So again, the, the image that John perceives when he sees the lamb in heaven is a lamb who had been sacrificed already, slain, but alive. Consistent, of course, with the account of Jesus, our great high priest, being sacrificed for us. By his own blood. Did not have to die and offer a sacrifice first for himself, but he offered the sacrifice for us. And the Lamb of God, slain for the world's sin, cleanses us from all our guilt and sin, and now will be the shepherd of those who are with him. And he will guide them to springs of living water, Psalm 23. He leads me, leads me beside still waters. And living waters, then, are not a pond, but coming out of the ground, springs, fresh, renewed daily, not stagnant, and depending on which part of the country you live in, uh, I, I'm not directly acquainted with, but I'm aware of alkali water sources. It's uh, just part of the chemical makeup of soil in parts of the, the western U.S. And livestock that's been raised in that area can tolerate some alkali. Wildlife can drink alkali water and survive. But human beings can't survive on alkali water. And livestock brought in from another place can't adapt to it and survive. So springs of living water, then, is not stagnant alkali in a pool. 
is flowing, refreshed, constantly made new. And it won't dry up in a drought because it's a spring. It's flowing. Okay. And this uh, Psalm 23, of course, the shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So there's comfort and peace in this new relationship of having come out of the great tribulation and being in the presence of God. We're in his presence. He shelters us with his presence. No harm comes to us. He is our shepherd, cares for us, gives us living water, and we're not hungry. We don't thirst. The sun doesn't strike us. No scorching heat. Keeping in mind that if you live in an arid Mediterranean climate, those are big issues. If you live in the Arctic or the Antarctic, scorching heat isn't a big deal. Okay? But given the environment in which John lives, the vision he has, addresses the question of what's your concern in your daily life. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. And uh, the other thing is, this is the one who will take care of us so that even if we do get sick, it might kill our bodies, but it doesn't kill us. Let me say that again. It might kill your body, but it doesn't kill you. Now, I say that in the, in the full theological sense that you have been born again into Christ Jesus in your baptism. And so your life is hidden in Christ with God. Okay? So if you die today, you're still alive. <laughs> Why? Because your body returns to the soil from which it came, your spirit returns to God who gave it. So if you die today, you're still alive. Okay? Pastor Tice, you're not making any sense. Well, yes I am. I'm just not making common sense. I'm making theological sense. Okay? And in one sense, it's not logical to say that if you die today, you're still alive. But it is theological. And, and when we say this on All Saints Day, we commemorate those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, who are departed, and now are with the Lord. And we rejoice that they are with the Lord and in his presence day and night. I've had this conversation with a couple of people at different times, different congregations I've served as a pastor, but these are parents who have had a child die. Sometimes the child was very young, not yet in school. Sometimes the child may have been uh, grade school or high school, killed in a car accident, various ways in which they died. And the person that I was talking with said, I'm very, very crushed at the absence of my child in my life. But I am gratefully thankful that they are out of Satan's grasp and they died in faith in Jesus Christ and Satan can't touch them anymore. See, that's what we celebrate on All Saints Day. That these people are now safely in God's hands and the sun shall not strike them by day nor any scorching heat and the lamb wipes away every tear from their eyes and Satan can't touch them. And so on All Saints Day, we are celebrating the fact that these people died in faith in Jesus Christ. Not that they died per se, but that they had faith in Jesus Christ, that they died a good death. And by the way, a good death is not a death in which you say, I don't feel any pain. Although, there are certainly people who have died saying, I feel no pain as they died. There are Christians recorded as having been killed by torture who were singing praises to God when they died. 
can't remember for sure. I want to say it was Polycarp. I believe it was Polycarp. I could be wrong. But Christian tradition tells us that when they killed Polycarp, they did it by roasting him alive. Tied him onto a metal grill. Put him over a fire. And while they were doing that, one of the people who was recording the events of his death wrote that this Christian said, you should turn me over, I'm not done on the other side yet. Now, how can you say something like that when you're being roasted alive? The answer is, we are not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And the Spirit of God is alive in us and is more powerful than what's harming us physically. The coronavirus is a very unpleasant event, if you get it from what I hear, for some people, and other people don't even know they have it. It kills certain individuals, and others contract the virus, recover from the virus, and don't even know they did. So, just like every virus, affects different people differently. Some people have allergies. Some people walk outdoors in the springtime and the flowers are blooming and there's pollen in the air and they immediately can't breathe. Other people aren't affected by that at all. So are, are plants bad? Is pollen bad for you? Well, if you have bad allergies, maybe it is. So should we eliminate all pollen from the world? Absolutely not. <laughs> So the, the human body is affected by sin. This is, again, an argument against evolution. If we were improving, no one would have allergies anymore because by now, evolution should have bred that out of us. All people with allergies should have disappeared by now. Don't you think? If evolution were true, this should have happened by now. We've been around long enough. We shouldn't have allergies anymore, but we do. Newborn children have allergies. How is this possible? How come evolution hasn't fixed this yet? Answer, evolution isn't true. Okay. At least that's my argument. All right. Um, but the, uh, this, the statement that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes says that those who have died in faith in the Lord are out of the harm of sin and death and Satan. They're secure and safe. And that's what we celebrate on All Saints Day that they proclaim Jesus Christ while alive and having died, fallen asleep, been translated, they're now in his presence. And uh, we recognize the fact that they remain part of Christ's body, of which he is the head, and you and I are also members. Every time we have the preface to the Lord's Supper, where we say, therefore with angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven, this passage right here, Revelation 7, the 144,000, the great multitude that no one could number, which is interesting. You got 144,000 have been enumerated, now you get a, a, a great crowd no one can number. <laughs> well, wait a minute, which one is it? Well, it's a symbolic number, okay? This is why you've got to remember that this is a type of literature called uh, apocalyptic or revelational literature. Uh, we sometimes refer to it as being um, the end of the age type literature. It's not meant to be read like a narrative or a history book. It is a revelation. Eschatological, end of the age, apocalypsis, the, the Greek word literally means revelation taking away that which obscures it. So it's now visible. It's a revelation. The apocalypse. People use that term today as an adjective to describe the uh, arrival of the plagues and the, the death, riding a pale horse and all those things from the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Well, that comes right out of the revelation, the apocalypse. God will send judgment on the earth. 
and without trying to be too particular, uh, we, we see an increase in earthquakes, fires destroying places, California, various parts of Washington and Oregon and our country, other parts of the world, the Amazon rainforest has had fires, there are volcanoes erupting. Let me put that another way. The end of the age is approaching, and so this idea that as human beings we can reverse climate change assumes we caused it by our physical actions, not our spiritual actions. The reality very well may be that we are the cause of climate change, but it's not burning fossil fuels. It's disobeying God. It's our sinful human nature being rewarded with its just desserts. And the wages of sin is death. And so perhaps climate change that is harmful in some places is actually the consequence of our sin. Now, you'll notice I'm not saying deliberately this is exactly the cause and effect, but it's a factor. And if you read the Revelation, it's clear that a third of the earth is going to be affected and a fourth of the earth will be damaged and people will be killed and the population of the world will be reduced. Isn't it true, too, that deserts are extending in the world? Getting well, some deserts certainly are. The Sahara has been expanding for a long time. I don't know about the Gobi Desert and out in in Central Asia, the steppes of of Mongolia. There are arid regions there, and then deserts. And Australia has deserts. So it's certainly probable that they're expanding in various places. It wasn't very long ago that Australia had terrible fires. Yeah, yeah, and. Scripture does talk about signs at the end of, of the age coming, and I think we can say these are some of those signs. Okay, let's move on to our epistle, 1 John chapter 3. Uh, 1 John uh, has these themes of, of life and light and truth and love uh, recurring. And here we find uh, the particular theme of love being touched on again. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Um, another translation uses the word behold, what manner of love, see what kind, behold. I'd like to identify this as, as a uh, Greek version of a Hebrew phrase, or a Hebrew verb, hini, behold, look, see. God has made it known to you now. So the, the word see here is very likely the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word hini, which is behold, the Lord is doing something. I'm showing you what God is doing. And what John is saying here is, I'm showing you what kind of love the Father has given us. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, you are my children, and you are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And uh, Jesus um, talks about this. Um, you, know, you did not recognize me like your, your fathers didn't recognize the prophets who came before me. The Gospel of John talks about Jesus being the light of the world. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, he gave power to become, power to be the children of God. So this is the same theme from John chapter 1, the gospel. And we are God's children. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. Now we're back to All Saints Day. When the end of the age comes, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he, God, is pure. When he appears, we shall be like him. 
because we shall see him as he is. Which means our sinful human nature will not be obstructing our relationship with God anymore. So, if you've washed your robe white in the blood of the Lamb, if you've been washed, baptized into Christ Jesus, Titus chapter 5, washing and rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. According to his mercy, he saved us. God looks at you and what does he see? His child, washed clean in the blood of Christ. Ephesians 5, what did Jesus do? He prepared his bride for himself, washing her with water through the word that he might present his bride to himself without blemish or spot. Guess what? He's the lamb without blemish or spot. His bride is now without blemish or spot because we're covered with his righteousness. He's washed us clean by the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. He saved us. Washing us with water through the word, Ephesians chapter 5. Washed our robes white in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 7. Scripture is explicit about this. You have been cleansed from sin. You are cleansed from sin. Yeah. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. What makes you pure? Is it your actions? No. It's the faith you have. If you hope in him, you're trusting Jesus. You're trusting God's righteousness, not your own. So when you have hope in him, you're pure as he is pure. And when you have hope in yourself, you're a dirty, rotten, stinking, to borrow a phrase from Martin Luther, sack of maggots. Huh? Yeah, you're just going to decay one day, right? Even if the embalmer does pump you full of stuff, you're still going to decay one day. All right. Moving on to the gospel. Matthew chapter 5. This is called the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? So as we look at this section, Jesus has been tempted by Satan in the desert, in the wilderness region of, of Sinai, Judea rather, and he comes back, and from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, "Be repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and then he walks along the Sea of Galilee, he calls Simon, also called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net, and also James and John, sons of Zebedee, and he is teaching great crowds, and they brought him all the sick as he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Those afflicted with various diseases, pains, oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the ten cities, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Or in other words, every place where the people of Israel had settled. He's just, Matthew has just described for us the land of Cana, which was occupied by the twelve tribes of Israel. These terms, Galilee, the, the Decapolis, beyond the Jordan, Judea, Jerusalem. This is this, this, uh, the uh, territory settled by the 12 tribes when they came out of Egypt. And, and to keep in mind that the focus in Matthew is that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament promises as the people of Israel failed to do. Jesus now does. And we're about to encounter the first of the five segments of Jesus teaching the people, sometimes compared then also to the five books of Moses. And so what you have is promised land, people are in it, and now the new teacher comes, teaching with authority. And he'll teach five different times, just like Moses wrote five different books. And there are those who will tell you this is deliberate in Matthew's effort to say Jesus replaces Moses. Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up you a prophet like me out of the midst of your brothers. To him you shall listen. And he shall go before you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come back when it's ready and take you to be where I am. Where I'm going you cannot follow. 
I'll come back and get you. He will go before you. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and pioneer, perfecter, finisher of our faith, the one who goes before. Again and again in Scripture, the same concept is used with different words. Jesus goes before us to prepare our place. And when we get there, we get to live in his house, and he'll protect us with his presence. And seeing the crowds that were following him, Jesus went up on the mountain. We don't know which one. A mountain. If you go to, to Israel today and take a tour of the Holy Land, they will show you a mountainside and say they think this is where Jesus taught the crowds, where the Sermon on the Mount took place. It's probable that they're right. But it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. The question is not which mountain was it. The question is, who did the one on the mountain say, who say he was? What did he say about himself? All right. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Because he sat down, he officially said, school's in session, boys and girls. The teacher ran, went into the classroom and rang the bell. Remember years ago when recess was over and the teacher would hand it, grab that handbell and ring it? You don't remember that, do you, Melanie? It's okay. You're younger than the rest of us. I hated to hear that. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, this is the signal that the teacher is about to teach. He sat down. The sitting down is a rabbi about to teach. When Jesus read the scriptures in the synagogue, he stood to read the scriptures, then he sat down, which meant he's about to teach. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Okay. And he opened his mouth and taught them, his disciples. The crowd overheard, if you will. But he's teaching his disciples. And he's intentionally teaching where the people can overhear. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And this word blessed in the Greek, um, markiri, uh, is, is the Greek word uh, for the Hebrew word baruch, blessed. Uh, it's a condition of living in righteousness with God's approval. That's what the word blessed literally means. And so we occasionally hear people talking about a dead believer in Christ as the blessed so-and-so. The blessed St. Andrew. Why is he blessed? Because he had faith in Jesus Christ and counted righteous. Why is he called saint? Because he is one of God's holy ones. Just like you are a saint, one of God's holy ones. And again, the trick question is in that word. Okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, humble. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek, by the way, is a, a word that gets misunderstood. Some people think of meek as, I'm going to use a phrase you've heard somewhere along the line, Casper Milk Toast. I don't know who that character was, but we all have heard of Casper Milk Toast, or at least a person being a milk toast. Okay? That's not what meek is. Meek is one who is powerful and able to do something, but holds back instead of asserting their power. Whose child are you? God. And who has promised to answer you when you call on him? God. God. So how much power do you have at your disposal? Yeah. <laughs> you do. So how should you use it? Carefully, wisely, for the good of others. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those who have power in God will inherit the new creation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Neither shall they hunger nor thirst anymore. Every once in a while you can figure out why the readings match up <laughs> when you get a phrase like that in plain sight. For they shall be satisfied. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will receive it. In whose blood have you washed yourself? The blood of the Lamb, who has washed you with water through the word to make you holy and acceptable and blameless in his sight. Do you have righteousness now? Yes, you do. 
So you are satisfied in Christ Jesus. Okay. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy is to hold back punishment that can legitimately be given out. This happens all the time in families. Parents will do it with children, where upon occasion they will not apply punishment to a child, although they may discipline them. They may occasionally hold back something the child has deserved. You know, there are times when I know I disobeyed my parents, and they did not hold back food from me. They did not say, because you have refused to obey us, we can tell you you are not welcome to eat at our table. They didn't do that. They were merciful. They fed me anyway. Because of who parents are. Keep in mind that God calls himself our father, so we understand what this means. When a parent treats a child with mercy and love, still disciplining them, yes, but never giving them everything they deserve as having been disobedient children. That's merciful. Blessed are those who hold back punishment that others have deserved, for they shall also receive mercy. If we act like our Heavenly Father, we show we are His children, and we then continue to receive His mercy. Jesus told a parable about a man who was forgiven a debt he could never pay. Remember that parable? The man owed... 2,000 years wages, was it? I think that was, was the figure. And he said, be patient with me, I'll pay back everything. And his master had compassion on him, forgave him. He went out and found a man who owed him 100 days wages, and he said, pay me everything. And he said, be patient, and I'll pay you. And he refused and threw him in prison. And the master came and said, what? I forgave you all that debt. You should have been merciful as I am merciful and forgiving your fellow debtor. Well, see, here Jesus says it in words, later he tells it in a story. Because it's easy to forget these words, the story is very easy to remember, which is the purpose of parables. Do you ever hear a story about a, a man named George Washington and, and his uh, family had cherry trees, and uh, supposedly one day he went out with, a, with an axe and chopped down one of the cherry trees, and his father was upset that a cherry tree had been destroyed. Do you remember hearing this story? Yeah, it's pretty much fiction. But boy, it's your work to get the point across. I cannot tell a lie. Yeah. <laughs> you got the point of the story, even though the story was made up. Now, I'm not saying George Washington never chopped down a tree. His dad told him not to chop down or something. I'm saying that story can't be found in any written record anywhere in the life of George Washington from his time. It shows up later. Okay. But it works well for telling people not to tell lies. Okay. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What makes us pure in heart? Faith in Jesus Christ. And they are standing before his throne, and they are in his presence day and night. And they are bowing down and worshiping him. They shall see God. The pure in heart shall see God. Not the pure in deed, pure in heart. Notice the condition is new on the inside, not good on the outside. Which is not to say you can ignore being good on the outside. It's saying that won't get you to see God. Pure heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And we seek to make peace. Live at peace with all people as far as it depends on you, the Apostle Paul writes. Jesus says, My peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. What is peace? Peace is the contentment and the comfort and assurance of being right with God through Jesus Christ. And knowing that because we are right with God through Jesus Christ, we can now make things right between us and other people. Even when they don't deserve it. Because they never do. And neither do I. When you make peace with someone, it's not because they deserve it. 
like when you forgive, it's not because someone deserves it, because it has to be done. That's who you are. You forgive because that's who you are as a child of God. We make peace because we are sons of God, daughters of God, children of God, legal heirs of the Heavenly Father. Okay? And by the way, for those who want to be picky about it, keep in mind Jesus was talking to his disciples. And so if he says sons of God, he may have literally meant those men sitting around him in the circle. They would be called sons of God. And the other people out there, some of whom were women and children, because he feeds 5,000 of them when he's done teaching, 5,000 men plus women and children, he wasn't necessarily talking to them when he said this. But the term sons of God incorporates the idea of children of God legally. Okay? Later on, Paul talks about being adopted into God's family. Full heirs as sons, even if you're a woman, you have full heirs, full rights of an heir as a son under that legal system. You are treated legally as a son, even if you're a woman, under God's legal system. So if you want to be picky about it, go ahead and be picky. You don't have a problem with me, you have a problem with what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is what we talk about on All Saints Day. Persecuted for righteousness' sake to the point of giving their lives. And what did they receive? The crown of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the reign of God, if you will, or the reign of heaven. Now they, they stand in the presence of the Lamb on his throne. The one sitting on the throne, the Lamb. Okay. Blessed are you and others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of false, of evil against you falsely on my account. Uh, I've heard somebody use the phrase once that there are children of light and children of darkness. And the children of darkness have to attack the light. They cannot abide it. And so they will attack it. And they will say things against you falsely because the children of light can't be tolerated by the children of darkness. The children of light, on the other hand, don't attack the children of darkness. We share the light with them. We're not out to get rid of them. We're out to bring them in. And the way to do that is not to attack them. It's to share the light with them. Let the Holy Spirit bring them to faith. Welcome them. This is one of those ongoing challenges. We, we tell people you can't live in continued behavior that's declared sin by God and consider yourself part of the people of God without repentance. Now, if you repent and say it's wrong and you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway, that's, that's, that's a different story because we all sin constantly. You know, it's, it's the challenge is to say we're not attacking the person. We do attack the behavior. Pretty hard to separate that sometimes, especially if you're emotionally invested in your behavior or if you've been misinformed. I had this discussion with people about a person addicted chemically to something alcohol or any other chemical substance. And some people are addicted to nicotine. Some people are addicted to caffeine. You know, there's, you can be addicted to what are normally un, unregulated chemicals too, for whatever it's worth to you. But what happens is they come to trust that relationship with the chemical. And intellectually they may be able to say it's not good for them, but they can't change the trust relationship they've developed on the chemical without God changing something else first. And this is the, the reason that we encourage people to uh, avoid certain behaviors because they can be addictive. And then intellectually you can say, I don't want to do it, but you're tied to it because you're a sinful human being with a broken thought process, even though you're righteous in God's eyes through faith in Jesus Christ. And as long as you keep saying it's wrong, I don't want to do it, I'm struggling against it, it's wrong, God help me, and you struggle and struggle and struggle, and uh, James talks about temptation and how you uh, deal with it. We'll get to that Sunday mornings down the road. As long as you're doing that, you're welcome to be actively part of the church of God. The minute you say, I can do all this, it doesn't matter, then we got to say, 
No, God says you can't keep doing that and be part of his people. You can reject it as a wrong thing and still fall into it and then repent and be forgiven and remain part of God's people. That's what we all do. What do we say when we come to church? Sin against you in thought, word, and deed. You know? By my fault, I can't do it right. I haven't loved you with my whole heart. I haven't loved my neighbors or, or myself. We confess that publicly to each other in God's house. As long as we're confessing that we'll, we're falling short, then we still have God's blessing. But evil has to attack the light. The light does not have to attack. It just continues to shine. And the darkness fights against it. But the light continues to shine. And the more we share the light, the more the darkness is pushed back. But the darkness keeps attacking the light. And that's what Jesus is saying. Utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Blessed are you when that happens. You have God's approval. Let me put that another way. If Satan is against you, you're on the right side. There are only two sides. There's Jesus and Satan. Those are the only two sides. And if Satan is attacking you, clearly you're on the right side. And if Satan is not attacking you, that should concern you. Okay. Rejoice and be glad when you're attacked on account of the name of Jesus. For your reward is great in heaven, not on earth. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Take a look at, uh, I pointed this out to you before, but Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. Take a look at the persecution of a prophet. Elijah is persecuted, attacked, ridiculed, under threat of death from Jezebel. Any of you been under threat of death here lately? I'm not talking about from an illness or an injury. I'm talking about human beings trying to kill you because of what you believe. Not yet. Not yet. Not that we know of. Not that we know of. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is okay. But what, what Jesus says is, if that happens, remember, what happens to you in this world is all temporary. It's all temporary. Which means one day this fine gentleman over here is going to have a new hip and a new pelvis and no metal screws in it. He's looking forward to that day, isn't he? Yeah. One day we won't need the reading aids anymore. We won't need the auditory boosters. Right, that helps. <laughs> yeah. Well, right now we just remember what God says. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. When you are persecuted for Jesus' sake, or to put it another way, this is not all there is. There is more. The best is yet to come, is what they say. Yep. I still insist on eating dessert first whenever I can, though, because Jesus could come back before the meal is over. I think that's a good idea. Yes, ma'am. All right. I'm too full to enjoy it. There you are. I first because I really enjoy it. Okay. Good plan. It's a well, good plan. Thank you very much for your presence and participation today. I know I didn't ask you a whole lot of questions that you had to dig deep for, but you had to think about a few of them. And like I said, in Sunday's sermon, the trick question will show up. <laughs> Just keep in mind that I don't ask trick questions to trick you. I ask a trick question to get you to think. Okay. Thank you very much. God's blessings with each one of you. And... Uh, just keep in mind, as we say in Spanish, Cristo vive. Jesus lives. He is a